kind of talk about it on this slide too, but she was so willing to be able to share with us her expertise, not only as a chiropractor, but also as it's a fit personal trainer. Is that true? Yes. And that's what I thought. Okay. Just making sure <laughs> not doing false advertising over here. She's willing to show us how we can be doing more exercises at home. I think sometimes we get intimidated or those nasty Revlimid side effects or whatever it may be that keep us from being able to go out, go to a gym, you know, being immunocompromised. So being able to take control of our fitness at home is really important. And I'm really excited to be able to learn with you some simple exercises that are safe to do at home, safe for our bodies, no matter how myeloma might be affecting it. Um, however, you do always want to talk to a doctor before starting anything drastically different from what you're doing now, just so that they're aware in case anything happens. So I just want to give that disclaimer before we get started. Um, I get to introduce Dr. Avani to you. So she is a knowledgeable, thorough, and passionate doctor of chiropractic and certified personal trainer. She graduated from USC in 2001 with a bachelor's in keen. Oh my gosh, I practiced this word. Help me here. Kinesiology. <laughs> Thank you. Study of human movement. She then went on to attend chiropractic school at Los Angeles College of Chiropractic, graduating in December of 2004. With a passion for fitness, Dr. Patel went on to become a certified personal trainer in 2006 through the American Council on Exercise. Her style of practice is unique, gentle, and effective. She's not your typical chiropractor. She takes time with each patient. And then last but not least, I just wanted you guys to know that she is involved in the myeloma world. She was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in June of 2021. So she perfectly understands what myeloma patients are going through as she's passing through the same thing herself. So with that being said, I'm going to turn the time over to you so we can get started. I'm so excited. Hello, everybody. I will share my screen in just a second, but I just wanted to say welcome and thank you for joining me today. And I hope the information that I provide here today is going to be very helpful for many of you because I've been through it. I was diagnosed in June of 2021 and months before that is when I was having extreme pain and discomfort. And then eventually, you know, I had all kinds of stuff going on. Eventually, got the myeloma diagnosis after seeing several other specialists to figure out what was going on with me. And then in, so in June I was diagnosed and then within a month started treatment. And at the end of 2021, did my bone marrow transplant and I've been recovering since. And the recovery was very, very difficult, very tough. And especially coming from a very active background, I was playing sports uh, three, four days a week, softball. I was playing softball three to four days a week before COVID happened. And then before I started having pain that wouldn't allow me to do anything. And I was really missing it. And I thought if I don't get a chance to get back to doing all of that again, what's the point of living? I mean, I was just in a dark place once I got diagnosed with everything and was going through treatment. And since the bone marrow transplant and the recovery for it and restarting maintenance treatment and being where I am today, I have come a long way. And I really credit the healthy and active lifestyle I had before for allowing me to tolerate the treatments and recovering so quickly after the transplant because of the mindset of wanting to get back to doing the activities that I really enjoyed doing and being around the people that I enjoyed being around. And I'm hoping that what I show you today will either be something that Get you started to doing something more later, or is something that is just maybe this is all that you can do and want to do. And I hope it's something that you see is easy enough to do at home on your own, just to get your body moving and helping you feel better in the long run, helping you manage the side effects of everything and just helping you feel good mentally as well as physically. And then, of course, if you have any questions at the end, ask them and we will answer them as best as we can. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right, and this will also be available to you guys also later on. So if you need to look at it later, you can. 
So let's start here. So about me, I've been doing health and fitness for 18 years. So I started chiropractic and personal training around the same time in 2005. And I've always enjoyed being active. I mentioned that playing sports, I have a competitive nature. So that I think helped me find my competitiveness against this cancer and the treatment. I thought, okay, you know what? The first couple of weeks after the diagnosis, I was just doom and gloom. And after that, I'm like, you know what? I keep hearing and seeing that these days, cancer diagnosis is not a death sentence. So I took that mindset and ran with it. And I thought, I'm going to beat this cancer, or I'm going to give it a good fight, or I'm going to get through this. And I feel like that competitive nature has helped me and my optimism has helped me get to where I am now. As Audrey, Audrey, mentioned, Audrey mentioned earlier, I studied exercise science and kinesiology in college. I enjoyed it. It felt really natural to me. And I think that's why I still enjoy doing it after this much time. I found chiropractic by accident. Uh, I was finishing up my degree in kinesiology, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with it next. My mom had gotten into a car accident and was seeing a chiropractor. I spoke to her about chiropractic and I found that it worked It worked well with my undergraduate degree to pursue that because everything that I had learned in my undergraduate degree would let me become a chiropractor smoothly without having to take extra classes or anything like that. And then I've also found that both the personal training and chiropractic work very well together in my line of work because chiropractic is all about human movement, restoring function, restoring nervous system, communication with the body, allowing joints to move, muscles to move, and exercise does just that. So I have found in my practice that both of those backgrounds help me give the best care to either my chiropractic patients, my personal training clients, or the few people who actually participate in both of my trades. Now, what are benefits of exercise? There are quite a few benefits of exercise. Let me move my thing out of the way here. Oh, there we go. So exercise helps with improving blood flow. It improves our level of energy. It improves joint mo joint mobility, which just means your joints, your bones, everything moves better. You can reach better, move better, squat better. Uh, it also helps with functional strength. Functional strength refers to the daily activities we perform, such as showering or bathing, dressing, cooking and cleaning, driving, sleeping, and sometimes even the work we do for a job. Exercise has been scientifically shown to improve our mood, our immune system function, and to improve our quality of sleep. And if all of that is working better because of exercise, that means our body can tolerate a lot of things better, whether it's cancer or not. If you get injured, your body bounces back faster, or you're less likely to get severely injured if your body is more strength, uh, more, if it's stronger, if it's more agile, more mobile. Exercise can be fun. It can be simple. It should always be something you enjoy doing, right? A lot of people think, oh, I have to go running to lose weight, or I have to do this or that to do to be able to be stronger or healthier. But that's not true. You can, there are so many ways of moving our body and enjoying it. The best way to stick to an exercise plan or activity plan is to stick to things that you enjoy doing. And if you enjoy doing it, you're going to do it more. And the more you do it, the stronger you'll feel, the better you'll feel, and the more benefit you'll get from it. Oh, uh oh, what's going on? Oh, here we go. So there are five basic movements in the human body. You've got push, pull, squat, or a bend and hinge. You have a lunge or a single leg single leg type of hinge movement and then twisting or rotating. Those are the five basic movements our body goes through to perform any of those daily functions that I was mentioning earlier. And I'll go, I'll describe that a little bit more as we go through the slides here. So now you're going to see a preview of everything I'm going to show you. So this part's going to go a little fast. Don't worry about it because you'll have the recording, you can come back to it later. This is a standing bicycle crunch. This incorporates the rotational movement that I was talking about, where we're twisting and rotating back and forth. Also, it works on uh, balance, because you can see in the photo, this person is standing on one leg. 
This helps engage the core, which are the deep muscles that help support your spine. And the function of the core is to allow us to stay upright without falling over. So it is important to have a strong core just to be able to walk, right? So you might feel wobbly at first walking, maybe after your transplant, like I was, I didn't feel like I could stand up for very long. I sometimes felt off balance. Once my core got stronger, everything else started to work better. Even lifting something that was two or three pounds felt really heavy. And that was because my core was weak. Trying to bend over or squat down or reach or twist to grab stuff was very difficult to do. So this exercise can help improve that type of function for the body. Standing calf raises. Again, this is super simple. You can be at home. You can be out and about. You can be at a grocery store standing in line. Stand up and down on your toes. That's all it is. It just helps strengthen the muscles of the lower leg, which include the calves, and then the smaller muscles of the foot, the ankle, and the toes, keeping those joints um, strong enough to allow us to propel our body when we're walking or when we're standing or having to reach for something, coming up on the toes. If you have to reach, this muscle is important to have um, strength in. Again, after transplant, oh my gosh, I remember I was trying to reach up on my tippy toes to reach into a cupboard to grab a cup, a water cup. I could barely get up onto my toes because it felt so weak through my calves. So I grabbed the step stool and just climbed up on it, trying not to fall over, grab the cup and climb back down. Now I can reach up more easily as I've gotten more strength, but also as my body has managed through a lot of the side effects post-transplant. So I'm sure many of you can relate to that now or in the past. Uh, Okay, lunges. These are important for walking. When we're walking, we're using single leg type of movement. As our feet go front and back, there's a small phase where we're balancing on one leg and then the foot comes down. And then same thing when we go that way. It's also good for running. It helps improve the function of running for any runners that are out there that wanna get back to running. Uh, it's also being able to lunge is good for kneeling. If you need to get down on the ground to pick something up, Let's say you have to climb under a table and you're kneeling to get down to pick something up off the ground. Having this exercise uh, performed frequently helps you get back up safely or with strength rather than feeling like you're gonna fall over. If you have stairs at home, lunges are great for climbing stairs. Vacuuming, very important because you're going to be in a lunge type of position as you're pulling that vacuum back and forth. So this helps with that type of daily activity. Push-ups. A lot of people think, oh, I've got to get down on the ground and do push-ups. Oh, I can't do that. Or you hear about girl push-ups. It's not a girl push-up. It's a modified push-up when you're on your knees. So this is a form of a modified push-up. So anybody can do a push-up to strengthen the upper body muscles. So you can see in the photo, it's done on a countertop. You can even be done on a wall. And I'll show you that ooh, very shortly here as well. But having good Oh, let me go back. Having good upper body strength to be able to push is good for if you have to hold things in front of you. Picking up a box and holding it uses those pushing muscles. What if you want to hold a little baby, a little kid, or your pet? Those chest muscles that we use for pushing up help hold things close to our body. And it's also good for if you have to open a door, whether it's at home, your car door, something heavy, or pushing something around the house. That's what this muscle uh, this what this exercise is good for. Squats. These muscles in our legs are used for getting up and down off of a toilet, a chair, in and out of a car. Also, we use this to pick things up off the ground. So that's why it's um, considered a hinge exercise because you're hinging from your waist when you pick something up, but you also have to use your legs to get down low so you don't hurt yourself. And I'll show you how to use the chair to guide you through a squat so that you don't fall over, or you don't hurt yourself, or if you're getting into it for the first time, you know how to do it properly without causing injury. And then hamstring curls. These are the muscles on the back of the upper leg or the back of the thigh. They help support the backside of the hips as well as the knees. And if you have strong hamstrings, they also help support your lower back just in case you have lower back pain. You want some muscles that are strong enough to support the lower back. I know that's a very common symptom in um, myeloma patients, whether it's pre-diagnosis, during treatment, even after. Okay.
Oh, Audrey, how do I, uh, oh, escape. That's right. I want to unshare this, Audrey. Can you help me? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Let's see. There we go. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's get started. I'm just going to turn on my other screen so I have my guide of exercises to go through that I just showed you. All right. So the first one is the standing bicycle crunch. So the Basic movement is just knees straight up and down. If I turn sideways, you can see what I'm doing. Knees are just going straight up and down. And then the torso is doing a little bit of a twist. So you keep your belly button pulled in to help with balance and engaging the core so you support your back and you don't fall over. Lift those legs up and down. You can use your elbows and reach twist towards the knee. You don't have to crunch all the way down. You can just use the elbows as a guide to know I'm twisting my opposite arm towards my opposite knee. If the shoulders get too tired holding them up, you just twist and touch your hand to your knee. This is a little more simple in case this creates too much imbalance for any of you. And you wanna do 20. So maybe you go one, two, three, 20. That's how you would count 20 of them. You could do one, two, or three sets throughout the day every couple of days. Next exercise, standing calf raises. That's just up and down on the toes. So same thing, belly button pulled into your spine to help you stay balanced. And then you want to squeeze your butt. That's going to help you maintain balance as well. And then you just lift up and down. And if you're having trouble with balance with this one, you can hold on to something steady, whether it's a wall or a tabletop, and perform the exercise and still get the same benefit of doing it without holding on. This is something you can work up to if you're too off balance without holding the wall. And same thing, you want to work up to doing 20 of them. The next exercise is a lunge. <clears throat> <clears throat> this one also helps with balance, but can create a sense of being, being off balance. So same thing, hold on to a wall. You have one foot back, one foot in front. You wanna make sure the front foot is flat on the ground. The back leg, you want that heel up. The further out the leg is behind you, the lower you can go if you want to. Otherwise, you can have it closer in, and keep it small. You wanna make sure the front knee doesn't go too far past that toe. You don't wanna lunge forward and back. The movement is straight down and up. If you feel discomfort in this back knee as you go down and up, you just scoot that foot back a little further and it puts you in a more proper position, more proper form to do the lunge without hurting yourself. <laughs> and then again, you hold on to something st stable, something that's not gonna move and you do anywhere between five and 10 on each side. And then when you're done, you do the same thing, five to 10 on the other side. When I first started doing these, when I could, I remember I did two sets of five and then my thighs started to cramp. So I stopped and the next several days I was so sore. And this was maybe a month after transplant. So take it easy if it's the first time doing it. <clears throat> All right, the next one is the push-up. So you can do this on a tabletop or a countertop. Kitchen counters are great. Kitchen counters are a little bit higher than how I'm gonna demonstrate on my computer desk. Kitchen counters are sometimes up to about here, maybe a little lower. Those are great because they're high enough that you can start at an easy intensity. I'm gonna turn the computer towards the wall <clears throat> and show you how you could do this on a wall. So arms are straight out in front of you. Pull your belly button in and then squeeze your butt. Tuck the tail around the lower back a tiny bit. Again, this stabilizes your lower back so you don't cause injury. And then you just push yourself towards the wall. 
and push away. And you can see my torso stays in a very straight line. I'm not letting the hips do any kind of thrust. This I feel straight in my lower back. I'm not trying to hurt my back. Tuck the tail. So you get a tiny rounding in that lower back. Belly button pulled in, hold that right there. And you can tell I'm not squeezing so hard I can't speak, right? Everything's tucked in and I'm still able to speak normally. And then push down and up nice and slow. You don't have to go too far towards the wall, just whatever's comfortable. Again, when I first started this, I was maybe able to do maybe halfway. And if you do it on something lower, it just makes it a little bit harder, a little more challenging. So then this just adds to the challenge. As you get stronger, you can move from wall to countertop to tabletop. And then eventually you can move on to the floor if you'd like. But for now, using a tabletop, a countertop, or a wall is a great way to work on strengthening the upper body as well as the core. Next exercise are the squats. Same thing. I remember when I first started doing squats, I think I had done five or six reps and my, my uh, quad started cramping up. The next several days, I could barely walk. That just let me know that even though I was only doing a few exercises, my muscles were so deconditioned. They were, had suffered so much atrophy or shrinkage after um, transplant that I knew it was going to take me a while to get my strength back. I was a little frustrated in the beginning. I'm gonna be honest, I was frustrated with how weak I felt, how difficult it was for me to do exercises and how long it took me to be able to do stuff again because I went from being so strong, so active to feeling like I could do nothing. But with consistency, with persistence, you can get there. If I can get there, I know you guys can get to the level that you want to be at. Just put the work in and you'll get there. Squats. Using the chair is great because, again, your legs, if they're really, really weak or you're still learning how to squat, a chair is a great way to keep you in proper form. Proper form and technique is very important to prevent injury. So you're just sitting in a chair, feet are flat on the ground. You have your arms out in front of you. You can use them as momentum to help swing you to stand up. You're going to pull your belly button in. When you stand up, try to keep your torso as flat as you can, meaning don't bend over and try to stand up from a squat. Instead, belly button in, try to keep your torso. You see there's a little bit of a hinge here, but my back stays flat from tailbone to shoulder blade, just like when we were doing push-ups. So it's okay to hinge from the waist. Don't round over from the upper back. That's the difference. Don't squat like this. You want to squat like that, like you're sticking your butt out behind you. So you stand up from the chair, squeeze the butt at the top, belly button in, sit back down. Try not to use a chair like this that swivels. This just happens to be what's in my office right now. And then you just come up and then sit back down. As you get stronger, you can use a chair as a guide. You don't actually have to sit all the way down into it. And as you get stronger still, you can get down low without a chair there and see how strong you get. See how much work your legs do. But for now, if you need the chair, that's what it's here for. If you can't get down low as low as your chair is, find the back, um, the arm of a couch. The arm of the chair would be that same height, but a couch, again, doesn't move and swivel. And you can use that as a guide to push your hips towards or to sit down on if you need to. That way your squat starts low until you can get lower still. And then the last exercise, the standing hamstring curl. So that's for the muscle on the back of the thigh. You can do this with or without holding on to something. If you do it without holding on to something, it's just improving or it's challenging your muscle uh, balance. Otherwise, you can hold on to something that doesn't move. And it's as simple as keeping the knees next to each other when you do this. And then you just bend 
Bend the leg up and down, reaching your heel towards your butt. Now, as you're reaching your heel towards your butt, look at my toes. Don't point them. If you point them, you might get a cramp here or here. So keep the foot flexed, meaning the toes are pointed upward. And then you're reaching your heel up towards your butt. And you can do about five or 10 on each side. And then when you're done, you do five or 10 on the other side. Again, hold on to something so that you don't fall over. If your balance is off or if you're still learning this exercise, start here. It will not take away from the benefit of the exercise if you're holding on to something for balance. You're still working on your balance, but you're able to focus more on getting the hamstring strong. And then as you get stronger still, like I said, then you can let go. And that's about it. I guess we can start our questions and question and answer session now. Thank you so much. I uh, I enjoy exercise and even some of the little things that you said there about tightening certain muscles or being aware of where your legs were positioned during the lunges. It's just helpful for me. I learned some and I reminded myself of some things. So thank you for speaking so clearly and so effectively about these exercises. I really do appreciate it. I invite our audience. I see a question here already. I do invite our audience to ask your questions in the Q&A. If you want to see one of those exercises again, if you have questions about certain benefits, um, one thing again to keep in mind is if you have significant bone involvement and you're looking for modifications, if you have, you know, terrible anemia and you're feeling really fatigued, we can talk about that as well. We, um, if you're wondering about how many reps again, how often do I do this? We're, we're more than what, well, not me. <laughs> Dr. Patel is going to be answering your questions concerning that. Okay. So let's start with Dawn's question. Severe neuropathy in my hand since bone marrow transplant. Do you have any suggestions on how to get rid of that chemo-induced neuropathy? Are there any exercises, movements, or anything that could be of aid to neuropathy? That's actually a good question. I still have a little bit of neuropathy in my fingers and toes as well. <clears throat> I did notice it was worse the few first few months after transplant. And then it started to taper off as the doctor said it would, but it never went away completely. And they said that that's something that will probably always be there. So I actually still have difficulty with super, super fine motor things, buttoning buttons I can do, but it does feel challenging because it's mostly my fingertips. So lots of fine movement is still difficult, but the good thing is big movement is okay. I can Oh, and I was dropping things a lot. Um, I still do if I move too quickly. So I have to be more mindful. So I would recommend that you just be more mindful of whatever movement you're doing, such as picking something up or trying to do fine motor stuff. Be real, be gentle with yourself, right? Be kind to yourself about it. But doing all these other exercises is helpful because our bigger muscles and bigger motions that we do through life, if those are still strong enough, I feel like they help with some of the skills that I still lack in my hands. For my toes, it's um, it's just a matter of feeling things under my feet, right? Things feel a little bit differently. I, I don't know if it's my skin that's dry, if it's because I can't feel because of the neuropathy, if gripping the ground is challenging and makes me feel like I'm slipping if I'm barefoot on... Um, carpet, for example, if I'm working out barefoot at home on the carpet. So I bought tennis shoes to wear when I'm in the house to do my exercises. So my feet don't slip because I don't know if it's a neuropathy issue, if it's a dry skin issue from, from chemo, or if it's a combination of both, but the doctor hasn't necessarily said anything really can improve the neuropathy with regards to exercise, but I feel like doing the exercise just helps me have better control over movements that I do perform. And like I said, I play softball several times a week. So what I've noticed is I can still grip a ball because it's big enough. My whole hand is working. So strengthening the rest of my arm, shoulder, wrist helps with that bigger movement. 
Um, so I hope that helps. Like I said, there's nothing really that I've known or heard to get rid of the neuropathy. I think it's just something that will be there and I'm hoping it doesn't get worse. And that's, like I said, just do the exercises to get more support for the smaller movements that you might have difficulty with because of the neuropathy. Yeah. I'll just add one thing really quickly. Okay. Is we had an acupuncturist come and speak and she was actually able to help um, lower peripheral neuropathy induced by chemo in some patients. Okay. So and you know what? I have heard that. I haven't tried it yet, but I have heard that acupuncture might be able to help manage or improve some neuropathy. I forgot about that. Okay. Yeah. I'm making, I see I'm making my own notes. Too. I love it. I love it. We're all learning together. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's just something to keep in mind. Okay. Diana loved the presentation. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Let me go back to that question. One more yeah, thing. Yeah. Too. So neuropathy is the nerves, right? B vitamins are very important for nerve health. So if you don't take a B vitamin supplement currently, talk to your doctor about that and see if there's something that they can recommend that would be helpful because B vitamins are very good for nerve health. Um, and I believe vitamin D is also very good for bone health, nerve health, muscle health. So if you're not taking any of those supplements yet or your doctor hasn't recommended it yet, talk to your doctor about the, those two supplements. So B vitamins and uh, vitamin D to help with some, managing some of that neuropathy. See if that also might help reduce it to some degree. Awesome. Thank you. So Diana's question was, how often do you do this? Is it an everyday thing and every other day? How often would you recommend that they're involved in all of these exercises? And then I'll add one more question. Do you recommend they do them all in one day or should they split them up? That's good. I was going to address that if you didn't ask it. So I recommend doing these exercises are gentle and simple enough to do every other day but you might feel sore longer after you do it so you might do an exercise on monday tuesday you're sore wednesday you're a little less sore or maybe you're still just as sore you it might take you a couple days to do them again so i recommend splitting it up pick a few exercises to do on one day, then the next day, pick something else in a different body region. So we have push-ups and calf raises and the standing bicycles. Those three you could probably do together. And then the squat, the lunge, and the hamstring curl, because they all target the legs, you could do on a separate day. And that way you could split it up. So every day you're doing something, or you could still have a day in between where you do nothing and just let your body rest. And that day would be good for walking or bicycling or swimming or stretching. Um, yeah. Does that answer? Awesome. And, uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. And, and everyone can clarify in the Q&A if they have a follow-up question or if we yes, didn't tackle sure. the question the right way. Yes, a question that I'm always asked, and I'm sure you are as well. How to know the difference between sore pain and like significant pain that should mean no exercise at all? No, that's a very good question. So significant pain means if you're doing something and, or you've done an exercise and the next day it just hurts so badly that you can't even function. Maybe you did something, maybe you pulled something, maybe you did something too much versus soreness where you can still do your daily activities, but you can feel some level of discomfort in the muscles, right? But if you feel something in the joint, so in the elbow, in the shoulder, and it's like a, maybe it's more of a sharp pain, or you just can't move in a specific direction, such as dressing or bathing or cooking, then maybe you have more of a significant pain that needs to be addressed with whoever you are seeing for that kind of health care, whether it's an acupuncturist, physical therapist, a chiropractor, or your primary doctor or your oncologist. Right. Thank you. Very well said. Great questions here. I'm excited to ask them to you. This person's wondering, they need to stay seated for movement stretches, exercises. So what are the best ways to get those five basic movements while seated? So there are quite a few exercises you can do while seated. I probably should have incorporated some of those. So let's see. 
about, oh gosh, that's like a whole other topic, right? But let me show you some stuff. Okay. While seated, you can do calf raises. Mm. Let's say you have a pet, put your pet on your lap if you want to make it harder. <laughs> Otherwise, you could do seated calf raises like this. You want to work your quads without doing without being able to do squats or lunges. Oh, there we go. Belly button in, foot flex. So the toes are up, and then you just bend and straighten at the knee. So as you're lifting here, you're squeezing through there. So you're turning on the quad. And then to get the hamstring, if you can't stand to do the standing curl, what you do is you have your foot on the ground. You can have your heel down or your whole foot flat, and you just put slight pressure into the ground. You barely push into the ground and you pull the leg towards you as far as you can. And it's okay if the foot bends a little bit, but that little bit of resistance as you're dragging your foot is actually going to turn on the hamstring a little bit. So you've got calf raises while sitting, work your quad while seated, and then drag your foot to work the hamstring. You can also drag the foot back and forth to get a little bit more through here. Mm -hmm. The lunges, because it's more of a single leg exercise, um, I'm trying to think how it could be done seated without equipment. Oh, you take your hands, place them on the outsides of your knees, push out into your hands and hold it for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five, and let go and do that again. And that will work. The muscles on the outer part of the hip without equipment. You've got your hands, so you just push out into the hands. How does that sound? Sounds great. Thank oh, for push-ups for the and then hold on, sorry. So for okay. the chest, right? You're pushing. You just take your hands and just press them into each other. Same thing. Hold for five seconds and let go. It's probably hard to see. Let me get closer to the camera. I don't know if you can see the muscles squeezing or turning on, but it's turning on the same muscles if you were doing push ups or if you sit in a chair that has armrests. If it's not too much difficulty, you can always just do a little, you know, mm -hmm. push yourself up out of the chair just a couple of inches. And that it's a little more intense than this one, but it targets the sim same muscles as pushing on the wall, but while seated. Yeah, very well said. Thanks. There's also um, like chair yoga and stuff that they could look up on YouTube. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then if you wanted to purchase minimal equipment, such as exercise balls, exercise bands, that would also work. And by ball, you can just get those plastic toy balls kids play with. I use those with my clients and it, use, it comes in handy for quite a few things. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So Barry is 107 days post-transplant. Congratulations, Barry. That's awesome. He's walking 10 to 13 miles a day with his wife. That's amazing. I can't even do that. Um, mentions that he wants to be able to hit balls again, play pickleball, run. How can he ease into this? And I think this is a common question among, like, as you were saying, recovery is so tough and you want to be yourself again. But it is unwise. It really just is unwise to expect that, you know, day one post transplant, it's impossible. Yes. To be there. So, how can, what is your advice for easing into life the way that it was before? So, it will happen. Let me give you my timeline. December 23rd was my transplant day. And then April. I forget, end of April, like 25th, 26th was when I started maintenance treatment. So what's that, December, January, February, March. So four months, a few weeks before starting maintenance treatment. I want to say maybe three weeks before starting maintenance treatment, all of a sudden I felt like, okay, I feel my strength coming back. I'm getting good. I'm getting good, feeling good. I decided, hey, it's the last couple of softball games. I'm just going to go see what I could do. It was not easy. But I just went out there. I had fun. Um, what I would recommend is start with these easy exercises. Or if you're doing stuff that's more intense already, because it sounds like you're you're walking a lot more than I was at that time. Um, just start doing movements or activities like pickleball and whatever other activities you want. Just start getting out there. 
maybe hit a ball against your garage door or go to the local playground at the school and hit balls against the wall there. I was going to the batting cages and just starting real slowly there. It was challenging, but I tried it and I'd be sore for a few days, but the more I did it, the stronger I got with it. So now's a good time to start doing some of those activities, not in a competitive nature, but wherever you can practice it and just start practicing on your own or with some friends, a little bit here, a little bit there. The more you do it, the stronger you'll get back, the stronger you'll get, and the sooner you'll be able to get back to those activities. It took me maybe six months post-transplant, maybe a little longer to feel like, okay, I can, I can do this. I could do this. I was pulling muscles, of course, when I got back to softball because I was still deconditioned. But now a year and a half later, I'm feeling, I'm going to say it took me about a year from yeah. transplant time to feel almost back to pre-transplant. And that is so normal. That is the most common timeline that I hear. And okay. it's unfortunate, you know, when you're like, oh, I want my life back and it takes yes. a year, yeah. but it really does happen little by little by little, you know, yeah. it's like returning to the golf course and you hit just like, you know, you putt and then yes. you hit the ones a little farther out and then you hit the ones a little farther out. I will just give a preface though, to anybody who's like really into golf it really does depend on your bone involvement. Mm -hmm. Definitely have that conversation with your doctor, get a physical um, therapist to just talk it out with you. Maybe you do have somebody hit your big swings and then you take all of the other ones. It's just, you want to be wise about your body. But I also want, I know plenty of myeloma patients that do great on the golf course. So it really, unfortunately is just something that is you're going to have to take on a case by case basis, but your life is going to get back to normal, normal. It will yeah. never be the same, right? but you'll still be able to enjoy the things that you yes. did. Definitely. And you know what? I forgot. I didn't touch on the bone involvement issue. I made side notes here. So my oncologist said I didn't have bone involvement to the point of having lesions or fractures. So I was lucky enough. I didn't have that at the time of diagnosis. So I think that's why I was able to actually bounce back faster. Also for me, transplant worked, right? The stem cell transplant worked, um, where for some other folks, which, which is very rare, it doesn't always work. So they have to go on a different medication. But once the medication starts working, once your myeloma goes into a non-detectable phase, my oncologist says that's when any bone involvement that was happening before has now stabilized. And of course, you want to wait if you had bone involvement, if you have weak bones, if you have fractures, wait for those to heal. I have been in touch with other people through the myeloma community that I've gotten in touch with since my diagnosis who have said their bone fractures finally started healing after failed transplant and after going on trial meds. And now they're able to start getting back to doing the activity that they were doing before. So always keep in touch with your doctor about that. Let your doctor know what you want to do, what you plan on doing and consult with them. So if you do have bone involvement, bone involvement, wait until the bone is healed and then start slowly. Another thing about these exercises is because they're using your body weight, they're called weight bearing. So they help with supporting bone health, right? And they're gentle enough that you're not lifting a heavy load, a heavy dumbbell that's going to tug and pull and cause a fracture in your bone. So definitely keep in touch with your doctor about that. and. If you have heart issues, speak with your cardiologist about getting exercise through a cardiac rehabilitation program as well. So that will help them. They'll be able to guide you to getting your heart and lungs stronger if you're having heart issues as a side effect of anything. And then for dialysis, uh, I was also reading, oh, I forget where I put it, that you can still do exercise, start with five, 10 minutes at a time, work your way up and always consult with your doctor while you're doing the exercises. Let them know what you want to do, what you plan on doing so they can make sure you are or aren't ready for it just yet or if it's something you have to wait for. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say about the bone involvement is after your bones heal, if you didn't, if you did have bone involvement, then you can start doing a little bit more. If you didn't have bone involvement in the beginning, you still want to wait until everything's stable and you're in a remission status so that you can start doing all that stuff without worrying about fracturing bone or causing bone issues. 
Definitely. And I see some questions here. We're talking about post stem cell, stem cell transplant. Okay. It, you should be right. I mean, well, in regards of like recovering to that extent, induction therapy, other therapies aren't going to take that much out of you with stem cell transplant. You literally, I mean, I don't want to sound too frank, but you go to death and back. Like they yeah. really try to wipe out everything, wipe out your immune system mm -hmm. to have it build back up. Mm -hmm. So if I see some questions here, I'm on induction with RVD. Could I start with these gentle exercises now? I don't want my muscles to atrophy. I've been having lower back pain and lesions and fracture that I've been told is stabilized. I think this is kind of the, I mean, as, if you're talking with your doctor, that's kind of the perfect time to be doing these exercises. Yes. Would you say? Yes. Is even during my induction therapy, I was still, you know, I lost some strength, but I hadn't gotten a lot of atrophy to the point of after transplant. So whatever I could do, I still did. I was still lifting weights, not as heavy as I was able to before, because I still had some pain or discomfort or I'd lost some of my strength, but I was still doing as much as I could before transplant, because I wanted to make sure I went into transplant at the healthiest and strongest phase that I could be in. So I could manage it, tolerate it and get back to fitness faster. But like Audrey said, they call it your rebirth day. They're resetting your immune system. They say it's like you're a new baby born again. And that makes total sense because you lose. I mean, you could walk, you could start walking already, not like a newborn baby, but that's probably the most that you're able to do without feeling like you can't function. So get as strong as you can ahead of time, whatever is stable, keep talking to your doctor, do things that are safe. These exercises are meant to be gentle enough. And if you were already lifting weights before and the doctor says it's okay to do it, if everything's stable, start light, mm -hmm. stay light so that you don't get too much atrophy. But I'm telling you after transplant, there's no control over the atrophy. It just, it just happens. And that's okay because yeah. it'll come back. Yeah. We, and I, you know, I've heard from patients, you know, I'd rather have a hard year and then more years to come mm -hmm. than to have given up, you yes. know, so yes. it's really putting it into perspective. Yes. Okay. Let's kind of do rapid fire to finish up these last questions. Okay. So Stephanie's wondering about back pain. Will it just be a part of life? Or is there any suggestions you have as a chiropractor and as a personal trainer to relieve some of that back pain? Definitely strengthening your core. So all that means is getting the muscles that hold everything in place, hold your pelvis, your spine and hips in place. A lot of these exercises I showed you target that. The stronger your hips, your butt, your back muscles are, the less discomfort you will experience in your lower back, but getting those muscles strong enough to support those bones is what's going to help mitigate that lower back pain. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Sue is saying, thank you so much for reiterating the importance of exercise. It saved my life since transplant in 2019 and her case neuropathy three years later, she still has in her feet, but believe it or not, she started an online walking exercise program. It's a bit aerobic. So there's a lot of stomping of the feet and it has helped and there's less neuropathy. So that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, with softball, there's a lot of running. I'm running a lot. So yeah. I'll have to see if I'm a year and a half post transplant. Let's see if it gets any better in another couple of years. Yeah. That, that, how yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like know. it. Okay. So John's wondering one more time, give the sets and the reps for each exercise. It was about 20. So I would say start with five to 10 reps of each exercise, two to three sets is ideal. Three sets is ideal. But again, if your muscle, if you're doing an exercise and after a few reps, you start feeling like your muscles are cramping or you just can't do it anymore. And this is, let's say right away after transplant, then stop there. And then as you get stronger and less sore, you eventually want to be able to do two to three sets of anywhere between 10 and 20 reps, depending on the exercise, squats, lunges, push-ups, those are harder. So aim for 10 to 15 reps to really work on strength. 
And then the standing bicycle crunches where you're twisting the calf raises and I think the hamstring crawl, the standing, those are less intense. So aim for two to three sets of 20 reps for those. Right. Makes sense. Let's talk about cramps. Lisa's wondering if she's doing an exercise and gets a cramp, does that mean stop doing it? I would say stop doing it because what's happening is the muscle. So muscle cramp means if these are your muscle fibers, these are healthy muscle fibers. When you squeeze and relax them, they glide properly. Now, when they're cramping, they're stuck here and then they're tightening up. So they don't know how to relax. That's what a cramp is. A cramp is a muscle freaking out, not knowing how to relax, not knowing how to let go and open up. So if you start cramping, stop. Because if you keep going, you might actually pull a muscle. You might tear a muscle and um, you might be too sore the next couple of days because of injury or might be worse where maybe for a couple of weeks you're out of commission. So if you feel something cramping, stop. That's what I had to do. I was doing squats and lunges. My thighs started cramping. I thought, oh, I better stop. And then I was sore for maybe four or five days, maybe even a little longer before I attempted to even try them again. Because of fear. Do you stretch right after to mitigate the cramp, or do you just kind of rest and let it be? So what I did is I just let them rest for a bit. And then I waited until I was done doing whatever other exercises I may have wanted to do. I skipped the rest of the squats and lunges, finished up a couple of the other things, and then stretched gently after. Because if you try to stretch right away, the muscle's still freaking out. If you try to stretch it, it's going to pull it and hurt more. So you wait till it has a chance to calm down, then you gently stretch it. You can also massage it. Icing is really, really important. If you get a cramp or you get really sore, put ice on those muscles. It'll help with the inflammation. Inflammation is what contributes to pain. Ice helps bring down the inflammation, which lessens the pain and it makes it more comfortable. It allows everything to heal faster. If you keep the inflammation there, it doesn't heal as quickly. So ice is really good too. If you get a cramp, let the muscle relax. Try to massage it with your hands or um, massage guns or rolling sticks, foam rollers, and then stretch it really gently and ice. Ice for 10 to 20 minutes, couple every couple hours for a few days. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Jay is wondering, any exercises for plantar fasc fasciitis? Yes, I think so. F-A-S-C-I-A. So I deal with that a lot. I had it when I first started playing softball many, many years ago. Um, shoot, I wish I had it. But if you have a golf ball or a frozen plastic water bottle, you can roll the bottom of your foot on it. That massages the plantar fascia. If this is your foot. It massages that section from, oh, here we go. From here <laughs> to here. You're probably gonna have a lot of pain here, a lot of tightness here. So you wanna roll it, massage it, ice it. The other thing you can do is you take your toes and your fingers in between them. So you're stretching the muscles between the toes. That helps open up more movement here to take pressure off the plantar fascia. The calf stretch, very important. Do this as often as you can, all day, every day, every couple of hours. Hold a wall, put that foot back behind you. Make sure that heel is touching the ground. Knee straight, hold for 10 seconds. Bend the knee a tiny bit, hold for 10 seconds. That's going to get the whole calf and ankle stretched out. Because when those muscles are tight, they can sometimes contribute to plantar fasciitis. Or when the plantar fascia gets inflamed, it can cause a calf to cramp up because of the attachment of the foot. That's try not to get too technical, but roll the bottom of the foot, ice the bottom of the foot, stretch the calves, massage the calves every couple hours if you have to until it starts to feel better. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question here. Um, how do you know if you're pushing it too far? For example, this person's worried that they're pushing it too far after transplant just because they've been able to do more than they thought they would be, but there's no pain. So what are indicators that you're pushing it too far? Right there. Pain. Pain's an indicator. If you have pain, you're pushing it too far. If you're doing too much too soon, which is what happened to me when I first started with softball, when I thought I could, my muscles started to cramp up and then I had pulled both of my quads. So I had to take a week or two off. We had a lot of rain here in California. So luckily that delayed games, which happened to allow me to rest and recover. That's how I knew I was doing too much pain. 
um, inability to function afterward. If you're overtraining, you might start to feel like you're getting more irritable, having trouble sleeping. Um, extreme fatigue. Extreme fatigue. There we go. Extreme fatigue. Um, more brain fog than normal, like I'm having right now. But <laughs> I was actually the same way. I was surprised I was doing stuff at the level I got to in a shorter amount of time than I thought it would take me. So if you still feel good, that just means your body is recovering very quickly and it's getting stronger quickly. So keep it up. But if you have pain, discomfort, extreme fatigue, that's probably a, a cue to take a, some time off, maybe a week off and then get back into it again. Perfect. Thank you. I got caught in my own hair right there. I don't know. If I saw that. I was like, what's going on? Oh, it's just my hair. <laughs> okay. Um, last question here. And then we have a couple comments. And I, Karen, you gave me a hard word to pronounce again. I don't know what's up with this session that I'm not being able to pronounce these words, but she says, I have ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis. Gosh. I know I, that I, I, I forgot I, what it is because I learned about it in school. Is that okay. is that fusion of your spine or one of the ligaments is getting hard and not allowing like the spine starting to fuse into itself? If she can, if she's online, if she can answer. Yes. Karen. Yes, she says yes. That's what it okay. is. Okay. So yeah, that's something that unfortunately you can't stop, right? I believe it's just a process that has started and is difficult to manage. Now, what was her question? How can she exercise safely with this condition? Definitely speak to the doctor about that, but you can still do exercises in whatever capacity you feel comfortable. So whatever range of motion you have, stick to that. Don't try to go beyond what your body is capable of doing. So when I say range of motion, you know, if you can only stand up straight a certain way or bend over a certain way, you stay within that range of motion that's pain-free, but you can still exercise with ankylosing spondylitis. It's just going to be a little bit different than someone that doesn't have it, but you can still do it. Listen to your cues, listen for pain, listen for discomfort, anything that feels like you might hurt yourself, you're probably going too far, or maybe that movement isn't right for you just yet listen to your body. That's the main thing when it comes to exercise, listen to your body. Your body will tell you when you're reaching a point of, okay, I'm going to hurt myself. Let me back off a bit. Listen to your body, but you can still exercise with ankylosing spondylitis. It's just going to be different. It's going to look different or it's going to feel different. Awesome. Thank you. And Karen, thanks for your patience as I <laughs> tried to pronounce that. And Dr. Patel, thank you as well. A couple of fun comments here. Babs was saying, if I put my 50 kilo German shepherd on my lap for calf raises, it would be really intense. <laughs> and I go, maybe work up to that. Maybe work yeah. up to that. You can do it yet. <laughs> that will be your goal. <laughs> yes. Debbie saying, be kind to yourself instead of being angry or frustrated that you're not the same that you used to be. Completely agree. Yeah. And Marianne is just saying, thank you for your presentation and advice. This was such a fun session, Dr. Patel. Thank you so much for leading us in this and for sharing your expertise. Yes. Anything that you want to share before I do some closing announcements? I just want to thank everybody that attended or that will be watching this later. And if there's anything else that you want me to present with exercise and movement, stuff like this, I'd be happy to do another one of these build on okay. this or do it again. I would be happy to do this over and over and over again. Great. Awesome. We have a survey actually that as people leave the session, they can take, let us know in that survey, if you'd like us to bring Dr. Patel back and specifically what you want her to help with, because thank you for being for willing. For example, to the plantar fasciitis, you want to go over that a little bit more in detail in the future. We can do that. Love it. Love yeah. it. Love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, have a great rest of your night. I'm going to Thank keep you. my audience for a little bit longer, but you're welcome to go. And thanks for being here. Of course. Thank you, everybody. All right, everyone. So we thanks are going to be for having me. Yes, it's our pleasure. We are going to be meeting again in July and we're going to be doing a live exercise dance class. It's going to be um, 
I can't believe we're talking about July. This is crazy. <laughs> um, but it's going to be similar to this format, but we're going to be doing like a Zumba class together. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. And you can keep in contact with people who are also interested in fitness through our connect group. We'll be including that in our follow-up email in terms of resources. You can um you can I, I got a comment Zumba is the best so yay I'm excited I'm excited that you guys are excited about this um join us for a, some upcoming events tomorrow we have an event about immunotherapy if you live anywhere from Delaware to Georgia you're welcome to join us and then if you live in SoCal or kind of the surrounding regions you're welcome to join us on the 9th at 6 p.m as we talk about mental health and then on the 10th is our non-secretory chapter and we're going to be having a group discussion about what's next in your decision making a link to sign up for any of those events and more events i didn't mention is found at the bottom of the slide thanks to our sponsors again for this wonderful event and thank you to each of you for helping make this possible and taking the time to be here i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did take care everyone thank you bye-bye